Now the next thing that I want to add into this game is the ability to shoot for both the player and the enemies. And that's going to be quite straightforward, but because each of the bullets is going to be independent of each other, but they will share some common properties, it makes sense to set it up as a class. So I will create a bullet class, and then every time I shoot, I will create an instance of the bullet class. So much like I've done with Soldier, I can create a player and then a bunch of enemies. I'll do the same for the bullet. So before I do that, and before I start creating the bullet, I just need to load in the image that I'm actually going to use for it. So I need to do that before my main game loop. Uh, so I'll come up here where I've got all my different variables being defined, and just underneath where I've got my uh, section for defining player action variables, and above the colors, I'm going to add another section which will be load images. So this will grow over time, but at the moment the only one I need is bullet. So I save that to a variable, which is bullet underscore img, and then I say pygame.image.load, and I give it the file directory. So mine is in img forward slash icons.bullet.png. Uh, yours may be different, it just depends on where you've placed it within your within your folders. Uh, and then the last thing to add here is convert underscore alpha. So I actually think I may have forgotten to add that on the soldier class. So if I come back down here in the init method, when I'm loading in the images for the animation, this is where I load the images one by one. So I need to add dot convert underscore alpha at the end. I don't know why Pygame doesn't just do that automatically and why you have to add it on. Uh, but I sometimes forget. So that's going to add in the image, and now I can create the bullet class. So I'll, I'm going to do that just after my soldier class. So I can scroll down uh, underneath all of these methods, and this is the end of that soldier class. So now I can create bullet. I can say class bullet. And because I want to use sprite classes for this as well, I will have to add in pygame.sprite.sprite .sprite here with a capital second S. Uh, and then I can create my constructor. So the arguments that I want for each of the bullets are, of course, the X and the Y coordinates so that I know where to put the bullets to start with. And then I need a direction so I know whether they're moving left or right. Then after that, I need to make sure that I add this line so I'm inheriting the methods from the sprite class. So let's add this init here as well. Uh, now I can start defining my instance and class variables. So the first one is going to be self.speed. I'm going to set this to 10. Uh, note that I haven't actually got speed as one of these arguments. And the reason for that is I don't want speed to vary. I don't want each of the different bullets to have a different speed. So every one of them is going to share this variable here. So these ones are going to be dependent on the instance that I create, and each bullet is going to be different. But the speed is going to be the same for all of them. Now after this, I need to create or I need to define the image that I want to use. So self.image equals, well, I've already loaded that in. So that's bullet underscore image. Uh, and then again, just like I did with the player or the soldier class, the next thing to do is to create a rectangle from that image. So self.image dot get underscore rect. Then I need to position that rectangle. So rect dot center equals x and y. So that's the two arguments that I'm feeding in here. I don't need to put them to self x and self y because they just go straight into this rectangle right at the beginning when the instance is created. So after that, I just control the position of the rectangle instead of these variables. And then the last one is self.direction equals direction. So I do need this one because some of the bullets will go right, some of the bullets would go left. It just depends on which way the characters are facing. So that's it. That's my bullet class created to begin with. Now, because I'm using sprite classes, these go hand in hand with sprite groups. So a sprite group is kind of like a, a Python list. Uh, it acts more or less in the same way. It just allows me to group uh, all of these bullets together. So when I'm creating a whole bunch of them, whenever there's any shooting between the players, uh, I don't want to have to deal with them individually. So I put them in a group, and then that way I can call all the methods in one go. So I need to make sure that I have a section here for create sprite groups. And this first one is going to be called bullet underscore group. And that is pygame.sprite.group with a capital G. So that creates a blank group. And that means, oops, that means that uh, I'm able to add to this whenever I create any instances of it. Now, what this also allows me to do, because I've inherited from the sprite class, I will, I will have access to a draw and an update method. So even though I haven't defined any additional methods here, I can type bullet group.draw and that's going to display any bullets onto the screen, even though I haven't defined it here. 
So let's do that now. I'll come down here into the main game loop and I'll add a section for update and draw groups. So the only one I have so far is bullet group. So I'll say bullet group dot update and then bullet group dot draw. And in here I have to supply the, the display window, which is screen. So of course, if I run this code, nothing's actually going to happen because I'm not creating any instances of these bullets. So the code is in place for it, but I don't have any bullets to draw. And to do that, I want to be able to shoot whenever I press the spacebar. So I already have a section when I'm handling my events. So remember, this is where I'm looking for key down and then key up events. And I look for button presses. So here I can just add in a spacebar in the exact same ways I've done the rest of them. So just under here, where I've got my event key for pressing A and D for moving left and right, uh, I'll just copy this down actually to save me retyping it. I'm looking for an event key, which is key underscore space. So when I press space, I want to set another condition, which is shoot. So all of these are just my triggers. So whenever I press one of these keys, I'm just changing a variable from false to true. But now, of course, I need to have uh, the exact opposite when I release that key. So underneath here, I'm going to say uh, when I have an event of key up, so I've released that key from the keyboard, well, shoot is set to false. Now, before I actually use these variables within the main game loop, I need to make sure that I start off by defining them right at the beginning of the code, just like I did with moving left and moving right. So if we scroll all the way back up, remember I have this section here where I have defined player action variables. I've already got moving left and moving right, so I can just add shoot equals false. So at the very beginning of the game, all of these are false until we start interacting by pressing any keys. So now that my trigger is defined, I need to process that. So if I go down to my main game loop, if you remember within here, I have a section where I'm looking for player actions. So as long as the player is alive, I want to look for all these types of actions. And the first one I want to add in here, just above jumping and running is shooting bullets. So I'll say shoot bullets. And I say if shoot, which is that condition, that trigger for, uh, for shooting. If that's happened, then I want to create an instance of the bullet class. I'm going to put bullet equals. So I just create an instance of it and the bullet class. And then remember the arguments that I took were the X and the Y coordinates and then the direction. So for the X and Y coordinates, I just want the bullets to be shot by the player. So it depends on where the player is. I'm able to get the player's coordinates by just accessing the player's rectangle. So I put in here player, which is the name of that instance that I've created previously. And that player has a rectangle. So I say player.rect. And because this is the X coordinate, I'm just going to say center X. So I want to be from the middle of the player, not, not either the top left or the top right. So just the middle. Then the Y coordinate is exactly the same. Player.rect.center Y. And then lastly, I need a direction. So the player also has a direction. So I can say player.direction. If you remember, if I come back up to the player class, uh, when I move within the move method, if I'm moving left, I set his direction to negative one. And if I'm moving right, I set the direction to one. So I'm already controlling that there. And that means I can just use that when I'm creating these bullets. So this is gonna create an instance of one individual bullet. But remember, I'm using groups here. So I need to add this bullet into my group. So I just say bullet underscore group dot add bullet. So that is basically saying take that bullet group and then add on this individual bullet that's just been created. So let's run this code and see if it works. If I press spacebar, I've created a little bullet. So of course that's not working exactly as you'd want it to do, but it is creating each individual bullet. And you can see as I run around, I can just make loads of them. If I hold the spacebar, then I just keep making more and more of them. Now, the first thing that I want to fix there, if I run this again, notice I'm creating the bullets right in the center. So that's not very practical. I don't want it to appear there, uh, partly because it doesn't look good, but also because when I actually add in the collision checks between the bullets and the environment, this is just instantly going to do damage to the player. So what I really want is for the bullets to come out in front of the player, regardless of which way they're facing. So for that, I need to know how wide the player is, and then I can adjust the X coordinate accordingly. So at the moment, I'm going straight into the middle of the player, uh, but now I can just add on the player's width. So again, because the player has a rectangle, I can get properties from that. So I can say player.rect.size, and this size will give me different 
uh, different sizes depending on the index here. So 0 gives me his x size, i.e. his width. So I add on the player's width. And if I run this again, let's see what happens. Now you can see it's appearing, but it's quite far away because essentially it's taking, it's starting in the middle of the player and then adding on another player's width. So I don't really want it to be that far out. I kind of want it to be somewhere over here. So let's multiply that by 0 0.6. Now I should divide, multiply by 0 0.5, but then that will just instantly collide with the player as well. So this gives me a little bit of a buffer and it makes sure that the, the bullet is always slightly in front. So now when I press space, the bullet appears just in front of the gun. It will avoid a collision detection with the player himself. But if I turn around, well, now they come out behind him. So this is where I need to make sure that I'm using that direction value here when defining the X and Y. So as well as multiplying by 0 0.6, I can also multiply by the direction. Self dot direction, uh, because this means that, oh, not self, uh, player dot direction. Because this is either going to be positive or negative, so when the player is facing left, this value is going to be negative and it's going to be to the left side of the player center. So if I run this code again, this way works fine, turn around and that works fine as well. And of course I can hold them and just make constant stream of them. So that's fine, the bullets are almost there, but of course now I need to be able to move them. And to do that, remember I have these bullet groups here with an update and a draw method. So they already come in with these predefined, but the update method is blank. So I can override that by adding in whatever I want into it. So if I come up to my bullet class, if I just define my own update method, I can tell it, I can tell Pygame how I want these bullets to be controlled. So I say define update, it doesn't need any arguments, so I just put self in here. And the only thing I really need to do is just move the bullet. So we say move bullet, and to do that, all I do is change the x coordinate of the rectangle. So self.rect.x is increased by the direction, so self.direction, because I either want it to be moving in the positive or the negative direction. And I want it to move at a particular rate. So in this case, it's self.speed. So we say self.speed. And run this code again. Now remember, this is already being called uh, within here. So I don't need, to, oh, within here, sorry. So I don't need to add that in. If I run this code again and I press spacebar, you can see all my bullets are shooting off to the right hand side. Turn around and go this way, and I'm getting the same thing. So the longer I hold spacebar, the more of them come out. I'll fix that in a second. But you can see it's now starting to come together. Uh, one little problem that's not immediately obvious, though, is that although they're going off the screen, they're not being deleted from memory. So in reality, those bullets that I already shot, well, they just keep going. So over time, I'm just going to end up filling up this bullet group with loads and loads of bullets that aren't doing anything anymore. I don't really want that. So I want to add an extra little check within my update method of the bullet class. So in here, I just say check if bullet has gone off screen. And this is a really easy check. I basically say if the if the because remember the bullet behind the image has a rectangle. The rectangle object is what essentially determines its position and its size. So if that rectangle has gone either off to the left hand side or the right hand side, well then it's gone off the screen. So I say if self whoops if self dot rect dot uh, right. So if the right hand side of the bullet is less than zero, so that means that it's completely gone off the side of the screen to the left, or self dot rect dot uh, left, it's getting a little bit confusing, is greater than my screen width, so the opposite check basically, if the left hand side of the rectangle has gone off the screen to the right, then I just need to delete this instance. So I say self dot kill. Now you're not going to notice any difference here because I wasn't displaying how many I had. But what's happening is as soon as it goes off that, off that side, the bullet disappears. And I can demonstrate that by instead of saying when it goes off the screen width, I can just put a line, an imaginary line here, for example. So rather than screen width, let's say screen width minus 100. So before it reaches the end of the screen, it should disappear. So let's run this again. And you can see it's like they're hitting an imaginary wall and they're just disappearing. So that's what's happening when I add this line and this section of code. So that's all working fine now, uh, but if you remember, when I hold spacebar, I just keep making a constant stream of these bullets. So I do need to address that, I need to fix that. 
But before I do, there is one issue that may not be apparent straight away. Now within here, I'm checking for my shoot trigger, which occurs whenever I press the spacebar, and then I create instances of the bullets. So this is fine, but this only allows the player to create bullets. The enemies have no way of shooting. So really, rather than typing this in here for the player and then creating a separate section for the enemies, I should instead just create a method within the soldier class. Because remember, anything that I create within this soldier class is common to any soldier instance that I create. So rather than typing in, in here, I will actually copy this out. I won't delete it, I'll just copy it out for now. And I will go up into, uh, into my player class. And uh, just underneath here where I'm moving the player, so above my update animation method, I will add in a new method called shoot. Doesn't need any arguments, so it's just self. Uh, and I can just paste that code into here. So it's doing the exact same thing as before. I'm creating bullets and I'm adding them to the bullet group, but now there's a method for it. So any of the instances of the soldier, so whether it's the player or the enemies, any of them can now shoot and it runs the exact same code. I don't need to keep repeating it within the, the rest of the code. Uh, but I need to be careful to change a few things here. Remember, I was referring specifically to the player, but now because it's a class, I need to make sure I change these to self. So self here, self, and self in here as well. And I think there might be one at the end as well, yeah. So change these two. So now that it's not going to be specific to just a player, it'll be specific to any instance that's shooting. So this is fine, this will work in the exact same way, but now that I have this shoot method, I can go down to that code that I had here with the trigger, and instead of all of this, I'll delete this, and I'll just say player.shoot. So let's test this out, just to make sure it works. And there we go, it's still working in the exact same way, but now it's a little bit neater, and if I want the enemy to shoot, I don't have to add in any more code, I'll just change it to enemy.shoot. Now to address the issue of having so many bullets uh, on the screen whenever I hold spacebar, I just need to add some kind of way of limiting the player to how many times they can shoot. And I'm going to do that as a cooldown. So that means that I need to create a cooldown for each of these class instances. So rather than doing it individually, I'll create another self variable. So if we come up to here, uh, I'll just see where best to put it. Uh, I'll put it just at the top underneath speed. So I'll say self.shoot underscore cooldown equals zero. So this will start off as zero, and then every time I shoot, I will set it to a higher number, and then I will slowly track it, uh, slowly count it down. So it's kind of like a cooldown that will allow me to limit how quickly I can fire. Now, if I go back down to the shoot method, I can add that into it now. So rather than just immediately creating bullets every time the shoot method is called, I can say if self.shoot cooldown is equal to zero, which at the very beginning it is, then let's indent all of this because I want this code to run. But before I do, I want to make sure that I set that shoot cooldown up to another number. So I'm just going to set 20 arbitrarily, but you can change this. And this essentially is kind of like a reload speed. So the lower the number, the quicker you reload and you can fire again. But by doing this, it means that now this condition is not met. So I'll create one bullet, but then I can't create another one until this meets back down to zero again. So that means I need a way of tracking this down. I need to slowly decrease this cooldown by one until it reaches zero again. So I will create another section where I will update everything. So at the moment, I've got these different uh, methods. I've got update action, update animations, shoot. Uh, it'd be nice if I could group everything together so I don't have to just keep calling them out here. So within here, rather than saying player.update animation, I will just change this to player.update. And now I can create a method within the class called update, and that's going to handle all of these different updates for me. So I'll do it right at the beginning because uh, it'll come before move. So just above the move method, I will say define update. It doesn't take any arguments. And then this one is just going to call all the different updates that I want. So I'll add to it over time. For the time being, the only one I want, first of all, is the update animation method. So I say self.update underscore animation. And then I also want to decrease that cooldown. So I'll add a comment to say update cooldown. So the only way, uh, the, the way I'm going to decrease this is basically by saying that if it's greater than zero, so basically that means that if I've just fired a shot, in which case it's been set to 20, then I just want to decrease it by one. So let's say self.shoot 
cooldown is decreased by one. Now, if you had a whole bunch of different cooldowns that you want to control, then you could add another method that says update cooldowns, and you could call that here instead. But for now, I only really have the one, so it doesn't really make sense to do that. So if I run this code again, let's just make sure it doesn't create any errors for me. Press space, and now you notice the bullets are coming out spaced apart. And that's it, so it's now working quite well. I don't want the player to just keep shooting infinitely though. Uh, you can do, you can just leave it so that there's no ammo counter, but I kind of want to add in a counter so that then I can add ammo drops for the player to pick up as you play the game. So that means I need one more argument, uh, sorry, one more variable within here. So just underneath speed, I will add another one for ammo. So I'll say self.ammo equals ammo, uh, which of course means I need to add in another argument here. Uh, but before I do, I also want to know uh, how much ammo the player starts with. So we'll say self.start ammo is equal to ammo. The reason I've got both of these two different variables here is that this one isn't going to change. So this starts off as my very, uh, essentially what the player starts with. And then this is the one that I'm going to reduce every time I shoot. So it kind of gives me a counter and a, and a way of knowing how many bullets I actually want the player to begin with. So then when you die, for example, the player gets killed and you restart the game, I can just set ammo back up to my start ammo value without having to reset the player class here. So now I need to make sure that I add this ammo uh, as an argument. So I've got scale, speed, so just after that I'll add in ammo. And of course because I've done this, I need to make sure that when I create an instance I have the same number of arguments in that instance. So let's come back down to where I create the player. Uh, remember here, I need to give them both the player and the enemy some ammo. So I'm just going to give them both 20 bullets. I'll just say that that's what everyone starts with. So now I have a self.ammo variable. So if I go back up to where I shoot within the shoot method, I can add in an extra check. I want to know that my self.shoot cooldown is back to zero, i.e. the player is reloaded, but I also want to know that I actually have bullets to shoot with. So we say and self.ammo is greater than zero. So I have at least one bullet that I can shoot with. And if that is the case, and the player has fired off a shot, then I need to reduce the ammo by one. So I say self.ammo is reduced by one. Actually, a little comment here. Reduce ammo. Okay, so if I run this game now, I'll be able to fire off 20 shots before I run out. Uh, but it could take a little while. So maybe I'll just reduce this to five, just to demonstrate. So let's set this to five. And the enemy doesn't matter. So I run this code again. And that's one, two, three, four, five. And I'm holding spacebar, but nothing's happening. I can't shoot anymore. I have run out of ammo. So as I add in uh, ammo drops, I'll be able to pick them up and replenish the ammo. I'll also have a display up here that shows the number of bullets I've still got left, but I'll do that later on. So let's reset this back to 20 for now. So I've got these bullets within the game now, and they're working just as I want them to, but you can see they're just passing through the enemy. They're not actually doing anything when they collide. And that's because I haven't added in that collision check. Now, that's quite straightforward to do. If I come back up to my bullet class and this update method, you notice that I was already doing a check for if bullets have gone off the screen. So I can just add another check within here with a comment to say, check collision with characters. So for this, I use Pygame's sprite collide function. So I say if pygame.sprite.sprite collide, and then this is just going to check for collision between a sprite and then a group. So the sprite that I want to check, first of all, is the player. And then the group is the bullet group. So remember, when I created each of these bullets, I add them all to an overall group. And then this last argument here is whether or not I want the item to be deleted when a collision is detected. And in this case, I want to say no. I will handle that just after, but at the moment, I don't want them to automatically be deleted. So the reason I've added this to be checked against the player is although at the moment the only one that can shoot is the player, remember that the enemies are also going to be shooting bullets. And this bullet class is indifferent, so it doesn't determine whether it's a player bullet or an enemy bullet, they're just bullets. So all of them need to have the same logic here. They need to all be able to check with collision with the player as well as the other enemies. So essentially it is just a bullet, it doesn't know who fired it, it needs to check collision against everything. So in this first case, if I've collided, or sorry, if the bullet, or if there's a collision between the player and any of the bullets within the bullet group, 
Well, that means that the player has just been hit. So I want to delete the bullet at this point. So I say self.kill. So if one of the enemies fired a bullet at me and then it hit me, then the bullet would get killed at this point. So the bullet would just disappear, same way as I've done it up here. Uh, but I don't want it to just happen every time. So what I actually want to add in here is an additional check, which is if player dot alive. Remember, I added this variable to the player class, which eventually detect well, just to the soldier class, which uh, tells me whether or not that character is alive or dead. So I don't want this collision to be detected against things that have died, because when I've killed one of the enemies, for example, they're going to run through their death animation and then they're going to be lying there dead and no longer moving or firing back, but they will still have a rectangle in place. So technically, this is still going to record a collision against them, even though they've already died. So I need to add a second layer of a check, which is whether or not they're alive, and in which case I detect a proper collision and I delete the bullet. So now I can just copy this because I need to do the exact same thing for the enemies. At the moment, I only have one enemy. So I'll just change this here to enemy and I do the exact same check. So if the enemy that I've just shot or that has been hit by a bullet, this could be friendly fire as well. If that enemy has been uh, was alive, then that's fine. We register a hit and the bullet gets deleted. But if the enemy is already dead, then the bullet just keeps going past them onto the next target. Now, as I add more enemies, I'm not going to be adding more and more of these individually. I'll just have a for loop where I'm going to go through all of the enemies. I only have one player and I'm only ever going to have one player. So I'll keep this section of code as it is. So if I run this now, uh, let's see if this is enough to work. There you go. So now you notice as soon as it hits the back of the soldier, the back of the enemy, the bullet stops. Now, of course, his rectangle comes down here. So I'm kind of shooting his feet now. If I go past him and I just keep shooting, the bullets keep going. As soon as I turn around and fire back, you notice they stop as soon as they hit the, the target. So that's already working pretty well, but nothing really happens. I can just keep shooting them until I run out of ammo. They don't have any health, so I have nothing to, uh, to do damage to. Uh, so that's quite easy to do as well. If we come back up to my player class, remember I'm already starting to fill up all of these individual variables, so I just need to add another one for health. So just underneath this uh, shoot cooldown, I'm going to say self.health equals 100. Uh, I'm making this applicable to all of the players as well as the enemies. So rather, you could, if you wanted to have different health, you could just add it in as an argument and then say self.health equals health. So then you can make your players and your enemies have different amounts of health. But I haven't bothered. Instead, I'm just going to make everybody have the same amount of health. So this is kind of like a percentage. I'm saying that they start at 100%. And then I just control how much damage the bullets do to them instead. So as well as this, I also need a max health. So self.max health equals self.health. Uh, the reason for this one is going to be useful when I come to do my health bars. So I need to know how much health I've got against how much health I started with. And as a percentage, I'll be able to show uh, the, the health bar for the player. So I don't need it right now, but it just makes sense to add it in so I don't forget to add it later. So now that they all have a health variable, now I have something that I can uh, reduce when uh, when a collision is detected with the bullet. So let's come down to the bullet class again. And in here, uh, I'm checking whether or not the player is alive and I'm doing, uh, I'm destroying the bullet and I'm doing the same thing for the enemies. So we can say here, if we've got this collision detected, so this is against the player to start with. Uh, well, if that player is alive in the beginning, we delete the bullet, but I also want to do damage to the player. So I can say player.health is reduced by five. And then I can do the exact same thing for the enemy. So in here, I can say enemy.health, but this time I'm gonna reduce it by 25. So like I said, I'm keeping all the health the same, but I just wanted to do more damage to the enemies. Well, because there's a lot of them. So you could play around with these numbers and it's gonna change the difficulty of the game. Uh, so now if I run the code, nothing's really gonna be visibly different because I'm not displaying these health variables. So I could add that in actually, I could put that in, uh, in a print statement. So just underneath here, when I've detected a hit, I will say print enemy.health. So if I run this code again, and I shoot, so I've got 75 left, 50, 25, and zero. So at this point, the enemy should die, but of course I haven't coded that in. So it just keeps going uh, into the negatives. So I'll just delete this so it doesn't uh, keep coming up. 
Now adding in death is actually going to be very easy into this game. Because I've already got all the variables set up within my player class, all I need is just one more method. So where I've got my draw method, just above here, I will add a new method called check underscore alive. And this doesn't take any arguments. And basically all this is doing is checking for whether the health is dropped. So I say if self.health has dropped to, so it's either less than or equal to zero, well then this instance of this class has died. So whether it's the player or the enemies, it's this one is dead. So if it's gone below zero, well, I don't really want to have negative health. So let's just make sure that it's set to actual zero. Uh, and then all the other variables, like for example, self.speed, I will set that to zero so that if the player or the enemy was in motion when they were killed, they don't just keep kind of like floating along the ground. They just stop where they are. And of course, I have the self.alive variable as well, and that needs to be set to false at this point. So lastly, remember, my animations are controlled by this update action method. This update action just basically says what is the current action and whether or not it's different to the new action. And then that just updates the animations being played. So I need a new animation here. So I'll say self.update action. And if I scroll up to my animation list, just to make it clear what's happening here, uh, remember, I'm scrolling through uh, 0, uh, 0, 1, and 2. So 0 is idle, 1 is run, and 2 is jump. So I can add a third one, which is death. So I can just add a comment here and say death. Now remember, the way this worked was that these just access the different folders within my image, fo uh, image folders, which then had all the different animation images within them. So just by simply adding this in here, I don't need to change anything else because this for loop will just list, uh, will, will uh, iterate through that list. So simply by adding this in here, it's going to go, okay, well now I need to iterate through death uh, at the end as well. And it's going to add that into my animation list at index three. So zero, one, two, and three. So that's it. That's as easy. As, uh, it was pretty straightforward to add extra animations to this. So with that done, I can now call this by simply changing the action. And I'm doing that within uh, this check alive method. So now the action is three. So when I change this to three, it runs the player death animation. But of course, until I actually call this check alive method somewhere, it's never going to happen and it's never going to be processed. Uh, remember, I have a method up here called update. And this is kind of where I want to put all of these uh, little checks and all these methods that don't really have to be added into the main code because it's just going to clutter the place up. I'm just going to put them in here. So underneath my self update animations, I'll say self dot check alive. So this update method is being run within the main code and that by itself is doing all these sub checks. So if I run this now, I believe this should work, but the animation will be a little bit funny if it does. Ah, of course it won't work because the enemy doesn't actually have an animation just yet. But I should be able to add that on because all the methods are already in place. I simply need to call that method for the enemy. So I have my player update and player draw, but I don't have an enemy update. So let's just split them up and then say enemy.update. And I believe this should run the animation. Yeah, so now the players, or so the enemy has got his little idle animation. Of course, he can't move based on left and right controls because that only applies to the player. Uh, if I shoot now and if I kill them, there you go. So it runs through the animation because his health is dropped uh, to zero or below zero. And you notice there's a little bit of a problem here. He's just stuck in this animation loop. And the reason for that is that the animation loop, the way I've designed it so far, is that when it gets to the end of the sequence, it just restarts back at the start again. So that's fine for idle and run and jump and so on, but it doesn't really work for death. So the death animation kind of needs to get to the end and then stop. And basically that should be the end of it. So that's quite easy to add in. I simply need to add that check within the update animation method. So let's come up here and just tweak a little bit of code within it. So if you remember within this update animation method, I have this last section here, which looks at whether or not the current frame index has gone beyond the length of the list. And if it has, then I reset the index back at the beginning. Now, this is fine for most of the animations, but not for the death animation. So I need to add a little check first of all. And that check is just going to be to determine whether or not the animation running is the death one. And that is done by looking at the action variable. So if the action is three, because remember, uh, actions are ordered, well, actions effectively relate to the animations. So action zero is idle, one is run, two is jump, 
3 is death. So if the action number is 3, uh, back up to here, uh, if that's the case, then I don't want the frame index to be reset to 0. Instead, I want the frame index, self.frame index, to be the last number or the last frame within this animation list. So I can just copy this bit down. And basically, I'm saying I want to look at how long the animation list is, uh, close the bracket, and then just subtract one from it to give me the very last one in the index. So that will stop the animation at that point. However, I don't want that to apply to all the other animations like idle and run. So I just add an else in here. So for everything else, the frame animation and the frame index should reset back from the beginning. So let's try this again. And if I shoot into the enemy, so as soon as he dies, he finishes his animation and that's it. He stopped and he doesn't continue to animate. And now the other thing is, although I am still shooting, you notice the bullets keep going through him. So I will be getting a detection that I'm hitting his, uh, his rectangle, but because I've got that check for if he's alive or not, the bullet can now keep going past him and shoot into the next enemy beyond. So that's everything that I want to cover in this video. If you found this useful, then please do leave a like. And if you want to stay up to date with these, then feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching.